So when I was a kid, I was into baseball cards, loved them. And not just collecting them, but I would, I would organize them and I would study the backs of the cards. I would protect them with the little sleeves. I, I knew the histories of card companies and all the players. I would doodle in class when the teacher was boring to design new baseball cards. I thought about bringing some in to kind of show you my collection that I, that I still have sitting under my bed, which is, you know, kind of embarrassing because I'm 37 and I still have my baseball cards sitting under my bed. But it's like 80-pound box of cards, so I can't do that. In eighth grade, I started a business with a friend in school. We were the same age. We were in this class where we were learning about these things. And we started a business to sell cards at, at little card shows. We'd, we'd buy a table and we'd get our stock and we'd have a game and we'd try to make money. Our, our goal was to make an A and to get a profit. We got one out of two, um, which taught me never to mix friends and money, which is a good lesson. Some of you have learned too. Uh, in ninth grade, I convinced my mother to let me invest um, for college, you know, it was time to, to take my money that I've been earning picking blueberries. That was maybe last week's sermon, and, and to and to and to invest that for college, for college, for books and whatever else it was going to be. And I convinced her instead of mutual funds, we, we'll do some of those, but let's invest in baseball cards too. Uh, and so we drew up a little contract, and she was uh, silly enough to sign it, which shows that I really should have been a Wall Street lawyer. Uh, and I still have the cards, um, although there's still a lot of college loans. So maybe one day I'll sell them and. Can depreciation on baseball cards be a capital loss on my taxes? No? Are you sure? Because there's a contract. Okay. I was so, I, everything about my life, like 12 to 15, was baseball cards. I spent so much time, I spent so much money on this silly the habit and love and joy. What did you do when you were young and just, just loved something? What was your thing? Comic books. Comic books? Stuffed animals. Stuffed animals? Yes. Is it now, now it's sunglasses? Yes. Okay. What is it? Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels. Yeah, you, you have dogs named after Hot Wheels cars, so yeah, I get it. Yeah, he still collects them too. His wife says. What else? What What other silly things did we do? What silly things do you do now? That's a harder question. Um, yeah, I get Hot Wheels. Yeah, <laughs> I got a little older, and my my next new my next thing uh, when I was about twenty, you know. I, I went in for the college experience, all in for the college experience. And, and um, some of us still do go in for the college experience. I had practice every morning in rowing, so I had to get up there, and that's, that's hard to do after the college experience. And I had to keep good grades, which is hard to do. And I, and I had to have a job. There was no way to, to make it through there without a job. But none of that, none of that was going to get in the way of a good kegger. That was important. Um, which wasn't about the beer or the music or the dancing or the girls or any of that, maybe a little bit about that stuff, but mostly it was about longing for acceptance. Mostly it was about this hint of popularity. Mostly it was about just the right to do whatever I wanted to do. Beastie Boys said that, I think. Uh, Beastie Boys has never been in a sermon before, but there they go. Um, and, and whatever you did at 20 years old, those ideas that pushed you toward that were powerful and real. There was a need to feel accepted, and so that's, what I, that's, how I, that's how I spent my outlet. And we spend so much of ourselves on, we, we've done it, on such silly things. And thank God that we've all grown out of that. It's been 15 years since my last frat party, I guess, and the only baseball cards I get anymore are in a Christmas stocking. My mom puts them in there. It's kind of a tradition, Pez and, and baseball cards. Uh, plenty of other things I've given up, even in adulthood. Change is hard in adulthood, Amen. Um, but not too long ago, I used to put this huge value. It was so important to my life to be right and for everyone to know that I was right. And I would argue about everyone and tell them, well, I'm right, you're wrong. Uh, and and I, that's, that's not really me anymore. I hope not. I used to buy into that completely. And I've kind of given that away. And I assume you can point to other things in your life, values and beliefs and, and ways you look at the world, ways that you measured what's important in the world. Things that were important to you, that mattered, and you bought into them so much, and now, eh, not so much anymore. We've moved on. And, and the harder part, of course, I have no doubt that there are things that I cherish now, perspectives that, that, that you hold on to, things that we define ourselves by, that someday that stuff, eventually it will seem old and silly. And I'm not talking just about the bad stuff. Not just about the, 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 the bad habits we have, but I think a lot of the good things we buy into are really just as 
silly if that's what we're using to define ourselves by. They don't help us live a full life. Many of us buy into the idea that working hard is an important part of who we are. Does anyone want to be considered a hard worker? Yeah, of course. Of course we do. Or being a good parent. I mean, does anyone want to give their time and their money and their sweat and their tears toward raising some awesome kid? Of course we want to do that stuff. It's a great way to, great thing to buy into. Some of us, the thing that lets us hold up our head each day is how we live in the world ethically. I'm a good person because I care about the environment or, or I work against injustice or I, I, I help other people, whatever it is, fill in the blank. That's how you define yourself. Some people think, Going to church and it makes their life worthwhile. And they throw themselves into worship and study and making cookies for Sunday morning and volunteering wherever they can. All of that is awesome. It's just not the point of life. For others, the goal is to make the world a better place. I hear that all the time. That's, that's what I'm here to do, make the world a better place. I agree with that. Um, but that's not what makes your life matter, whatever that word means. We buy into so many things, some of them really good things. We fill our lives with these values. We label ourselves with them. And that works great until, until something falls apart. And if the source of what makes your life worth something, if that source falls away, well, you've spent all your energy and all your love into a marriage and that breaks apart, what now? You've given every bit of your passion to serve in your job. And you've done a good job, and the company goes on under. What now? You've believed your whole life in nonviolence, and people keep abusing you. You work so hard at compassion and justice, and every time you turn on the TV, it seems like the world is getting worse and worse and worse. Like nothing you do has ever made a difference. This is an older book, um, After the Fall, by Arthur Miller. Has anyone ever seen the play? Frank, Frank has to have seen the play. Frank sings musicals at, at book club all the time. I don't know if that encourages you to come to book club, discourages you to come to book club, I don't know. Um, Arthur Miller, I'm going to read a, a section here in the beginning of the book, and this is a man dealing with his, he, he's been divorced a couple times, his mother has died, he's got all these demons, he's kind of speaking with a, a figure a little bit like God, I guess, it's, it's never on the stage, it's just kind of this thing out in the, in the audience. Uh, he talked about this empty bench up here, and I don't think he means it's an empty bench because there's no God. I don't think he's come to this conclusion that there is no God because he continues to talk to God the whole play. I think what he's coming to the conclusion that this empty bench means that God's not in the business of sitting on a bench and judging us one way or the other, which God said, for God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world. And here's just a little, little bit of a monologue from the beginning of this, this book here. Um, you know, more and more I think that for many years... I looked at life like a case at law, a series of proofs. When you're young and you prove how brave you are or smart, and then what a good lover, and then a good father, and finally how wise or powerful or whatever the hell. But underlying it all, I see now there was a presumption that I was moving on an upward path towards some elevation where, God knows what, I would be justified or even condemned, a verdict anyway. I think now my disaster really began when I looked up one day and the bench was empty. No judge in sight. And all that remained was the endless argument with oneself, this pointless litigation of existence before an empty bench, which, of course, is another way of saying despair. And, of course, despair can be a way of life, but you have to believe in it. Pick it up, take it to heart, and move on again. Instead, I seem to be hung up, frozen. And the days and the months and now the years are draining away. A couple of weeks ago, I suddenly became aware of a strange fact with all this darkness, the truth is that every morning when I awake, I am full of hope. With everything I know, I open my eyes, I'm like a boy. For an instant, there's some unformed promise in the air. I jump out of bed, I shave, I can't wait to finish breakfast. And then it seeps into my room, my life, and its pointlessness. And I thought, if I could just corner that hope, find what it consists of, either kill it for a lie or really make it mine. When we define our value and we deem ourselves valuable with the things we do, the ideas we hold, the beliefs we agree on, all the stuff that we invest in, that's as valuable as we can be, is all that stuff. Ruth, her stuff, she was a survivor. She had to be a survivor, and, and likely she started out as a young person, as an orphan. She lost her husband later. Uh, she, she evaded danger. She took on this huge responsibility of caring for her mother-in-law. She had to scrounge for food. 
Ruth had no choice but to buy into survival mode. And there's something noble about that. I mean, there really is. There's something honorable about handling distress and managing trouble and persevering. And that's great stuff. Some of you know it because you've lived through something like Ruth's story. You've been in her shoes. Maybe some of you, you couldn't help it. You just, you've been in her shoes and you developed a cynicism and an anger and you bought into me against the world. Or maybe you've been through her kind of situation, been through the ringer, and like Ruth, you got through with grace. And you said, I can do this. I'm strong enough to accept help. Where there's a will, there's a way. And on one hand, there's something just real and immediate and human and relatable about the story Ruth and Boaz. They get married, they have a baby, they live happily ever after. God doesn't intervene in this story with any wild miracles. You could read this, hear this story as God, as trusting God to get you out of trouble. You could read this story as a success of perseverance built on faith. You could read this as a statement about buying into hope and buying into love. But the pesky thing to me in this, these chapters you just read, what sticks out, especially in these chapters, isn't what Ruth bought into. It's not her survival mode and power and trust and faith. What sticks out to me is that Boaz bought her. Boaz acquired her for a price. And this is not a repudiation of the cultural norms of that day. It's not about women's rights. We've had that sermon recently. Uh, these issues aren't quite in the third and fourth chapter because Boaz isn't, he's not commodifying a woman by buying her. This is one of the, the good stories in the Bible here. The old Hebrew system, when a person was a widow, uh, certain relatives, you could call them in years guardian redeemers. I think that was your, your translation. Certain relatives were expected to protect and care for a widow. That's just how, they, how the culture worked. And guys like Boaz, that's his, he's a family redeemer, which is a respectful role because they saved people and saved the land and the family and they kept the family name up. And all through the Bible, God is obsessed with helping out widows and orphans and, and people who are in trouble. And this is the way they did it early in Hebrew culture. Christians came along and they invented a thing called deacons to care for widows and give them food when they needed. But for whatever that is, compared to just letting widows starve to death, this is a great thing that Boaz did. He, he, he buys Ruth and Naomi as a step toward justice. So what's remarkable to me about this? It's not the pragmatics. It's not the compassion. It's not Ruth's hard work. It's not their love together. It's not any of that stuff. What stands out to me is that what Boaz is really doing is buying Ruth out of her survival mode. He's taking her from what's defined her, the good and the bad, all the labels that society's put on her and that she's accepted, and he buys her away from all that. To give her a new meaning of life. The Bible uh, uses all kinds of metaphors about how God interacts with us. If you're a soldier, the Bible talks about God as a victor. If, if, if you're a farmer, the Bible talks about God as a shepherd. Uh, if you're into politics, the Bible talks about God as a king. If you have a family, the Bible talks about God as a mother and a father. One of the most common metaphors throughout the whole thing, though, is economics. God is always dealing with us with some kind of price, buying us and taking us away from all those ways in which we value ourselves, the bad habits and the good intentions, for all the stuff we buy into, the, the culture and the anger and the moral purity that seems so important. It's all junk compared to the price that God puts on us. God sees something more important in you. God sees creation, a purpose. And so this metaphor runs through that God reinvests in you, buys us back. And the Bible word for that is redeems us. It's a word from economics. And Ruth, the story, echoes that theme, not with a list of rules, not with cosmic wisdom, but in a, just a normal story of life. And especially in these last chapters, they point to a God who is in the business of redeeming and redefining who we are and why we matter in the world. Whatever we believe about, uh, I'm not good enough, or, or life is out to get me, or maybe we believe I am good enough, I've earned something, I'm supposed to make a difference in the world. All those sorts of ideas that play over and over and motivate our actions, God's in the business of buying us out of those and drawing us, us, toward a more holy plan together. You can tell the same story with a, with a paternalistic, judgmental God. You can tell the same story with all sorts of myth and metaphor or, or parable. Jesus talked about the lost sheep and God went after the one lost sheep. So, so, so important was that one lost sheep to bring it back to the fold. You can probably tell the story of redemption without God at all. 
But all of those to me boil down that there is something in the universe, call it ego, whatever you might want to call it, something in the universe that draws our vision narrow and individualistic. I matter because of what I do, or I don't matter because of what I don't do. There's a perception in the world that presumes there is a judge on a bench waiting for us. And there's something else in the universe, call it God, whatever, that looks at the whole thing and values how it all hangs together. It isn't that I matter because of my qualities or beliefs or commitments or experiences. I'm most important from a holy perspective because I'm part of a beautiful whole, part of an eternal story, and inspired to carry that forward. Not a judge, but a holy artist making little brush strokes to remind us how all the picture hangs together, no matter if there's a little thing right here or a little thing wrong there. And as much as all the regular stuff matters, how you live in community, what you do with your life, how you make the world better, all important stuff. But just as amazing is how Ruth is saved and redeemed. And I believe there's something awe-inspiring about how God buys us from ourselves and invests us into a sacred whole. We are at the deepest level, not the labels that we pile on, but we are children of God invested in the Holy Spirit. Formed of dust, we've been through the dirt. And now we're part of God's masterpiece. May it be so.